few statues of Jonathan Edwards were ever erected. In his church in Northampton, there's a bas relief of him, and Harkness Tower at Yale bears an eight-foot statue next to the clock face, neither of which are very accessible. Next to the entrance to Jonathan Edwards College at Yale, there is a grotesque that looks a bit like the college's namesake. So I was surprised to find a bust of Jonathan Edwards in the Hall of Fame for Great Americans at Bronx Community College. While this was unexpected, it is not inappropriate. Edwards began his ministerial career right here in New York City. I'm Christian Cuthbert, Edwards scholar and pastor, and I'll be your tour guide to exploring Edwards right here in New York City. Edwards moved to New York in August of 1722 to pastor a small splinter church from what is First Presbyterian today. But he would find that New York was a very different context than his home in New England. King William III granted a charter to the Anglican Trinity Church, located here at Broadway and Wall Street. Unlike New England, it was the Anglican Church who held the right to hold public worship, and this Presbyterian Church was the illegal dissenting church. To complicate matters further, First Presbyterian Church, gathered in January of 1707, was divided between its more conservative Scottish and the more progressive English members. Edwards was called to serve the small Scottish members that broke from the Presbyterian Church. In 1722, Trinity Church would have stood right where it stands today, at 89 Broadway. But at the time, it was a small rectangular building that faced the other direction, towards the Hudson River. Now, the Presbyterian Church would have met approximately in this area, a couple blocks away at the corner of Wall Street and Williams. Edwards Splinter Congregation would have met about one block north on William Street in between Wall and Liberty. Now, interestingly enough, today there is a Catholic church, Our Lady of Victory, that stands on the approximate site where Edward's congregation met. In Edward's day, his church would have stood much closer to the docks of New York Harbor. George Marsden comments that living near the docks cultivated an interest in Edward's for international news an interest that would follow him his entire life. For example, in December of 1740, Edwards preached the sermon, God's grace carried on in other places to a small private meeting. As the revival of the 1740s grew, Edwards drew on his love and habit of serving international news. In a letter to Josiah Willard, the Secretary of State for Massachusetts, on June 1, 1740, Edwards asked if there was any news of breaking revival throughout the world. I have sometimes since heard something of a revival of religion in the King of Prussia's dominions, and there have been some hints of something of that nature in some public prints. If your honor has any particular account of that affair, I should be glad to know something particularly of it. And also, what are the latest accounts of the progress of that affair at Halle in Saxony, begun by the famous Dr. August Hermann Franke. I've seen nothing since the account we had of Dr. Franke's life, published by Mr. Samuel Mather in Boston. I exceedingly want to know how things have been since Mr. Robert Miller, in his History of the Propagation of Christianity, gives an account of a glorious beginning made in the East Indies by some Dutch missionaries. But I have heard nothing since that book was published which was about nine years ago. Edwards' pastorate in New York was complicated by both its geography and its theology. About a month after Edwards moved to New York City, the Yale faculty under which he studied publicly embraced Anglicanism, 
an event that became known as the Great Apostasy of 1722. Remember, New York City at the time had Anglicanism as its established church, and Edwards Congregation met just a couple of blocks away from the established church, Trinity Church. Edwards was used to ministering in close proximity to an Arminian threat to his Puritan sensibilities. Furthermore, the rector for Trinity Church at the time, William Vesey, had actually studied under Puritan increased Mather before his own apostasy. During Edwards' time in New York City, he became increasingly concerned about the threat that Arminianism in general, and Anglicanism in particular, posed to his evangelical brand of piety. This is Trinity Church's burial ground. Currently, it is closed due to COVID, but someday when it reopens, I hope to give you a tour of all the people connected with Edward's life. Edwards moved to New York right before his 19th birthday to pastor a church split. Now, if that wasn't a tough enough job, he was pastoring a dissenting church just a couple of blocks away from the established church. But Edward's time in New York City was incredibly productive. Edwards would write about his own spiritual state. My sense of divine things seemed gradually to increase till I went to preach at New York, which was about a year and a half after they began. While I was there, I felt them, very sensibly, in a much higher degree than I had done before. My longings after God and holiness were much increased. Pure and humble, holy and heavenly Christianity appeared exceedingly amiable to me. I felt in me a burning desire to be in everything a complete Christian and conformed to the blessed image of Christ, and that I might live in all things according to the pure, sweet, and blessed rules of the gospel. I had an eager thirsting after progress in these things. My longings after it put me upon pursuing and pressing after them. At no point in New York's history has it ever been associated with holiness. I doubt that Edwards' pursuit of holiness was inspired by his surroundings here in New York. Instead, I think it's more likely that it was inspired by New York's decadence, even in 1722. While in New York City, Edwards preached the sermon, The Way of Holiness. In the sermon, he claimed that holiness is the conformity of heart and life unto God. Holiness became something of a preoccupation for Edwards. This is Francis Tavern a restaurant that goes back to the American Revolution. It was here that George Washington relieved his officers after the war. Now this wasn't a restaurant in Edwards' day, but the building did exist. You know, Edwards' time in New York seems unremarkable because there were no revivals, no major theological writings, not even a published sermon. But this time was explosive in its theological creativity for Edwards. It was here that Edwards began many writings he continued throughout the rest of his life. It was in New York that he began his resolutions. He continued writing on his scientific thoughts. He even kept a diary of which a bit survives today. And in that diary, Edwards wrote, I do certainly know that I love holiness. It was here in New York that Edwards began his miscellanies, his notebook of his theological ideas. And like described in his testimony, he began that notebook with his thoughts on holiness. Oh, of what a sweet, humble nature is holiness. How peaceful and loving all things but sin, of how refined and exalted a nature it is. How doth it clear change the soul and make it more excellent than other beings. How is it possible that such a divine thing should be on earth? It makes the soul like a delightful field or a garden planted by God with all manner of pleasant flowers growing in the order in which nature has planted them. That is all pleasant and delightful, undisturbed, free from all the noise of man and beast, enjoying a sweet calm and a bright calm and gently vivifying beams of the sun forevermore, where the sun is Jesus Christ. I find it interesting that when Edwards lived in New York City, he drew heavily on the imagery of fields and gardens and flowers. We have to remember that in 1722, New York City was not the metropolis that it is today. While it would have felt that way to Edwards, much of what lies north of the Brooklyn Bridge was then undeveloped fields. 
In Edward's testimony, he describes walking through these fields along the banks of the Hudson River in what is today Riverside Park. I very frequently used to retire into a solitary place on the banks of Hudson's River at some distance from the city for contemplation on divine things and secret converse with God. I had many sweet hours there. Sometimes Mr. Smith and I walked there together to converse of the things of God, and our conversation used much to turn on the advancement of Christ's kingdom in the world and the glorious things that God would accomplish for his church in the latter days. I had then, and at other times, the greatest delight in the Holy Scriptures of any book whatsoever. Oftentimes in reading it, every word seemed to touch my heart. I felt a harmony between something in my heart and those sweet and powerful words. I seemed often to see so much light exhibited by every sentence, and such a refreshing, ravishing food communicated that I could not get along in reading. Oftentimes, I used to dwell long on one sentence to see the wonders contained in it, and yet almost every sentence seemed to be full of wonders. I'm standing in front of what is now First Presbyterian Church in New York City, on the corner of Fifth Ave and 12th Street. Now in Edwards' day, this church stood at the corner of Williams and Wall. Now Edwards' time in New York City was brief. He moved here August 10, 1722, and he returned to East Windsor May 1st, 1723. But he didn't leave out of frustration or exhaustion. In fact, in his diary, Edwards records dreaming of walking through the fields in East Windsor when he lived here in New York. But he also talks about dreaming of walking through the fields of New York after he returned home to East Windsor. His time pastoring a small splinter church in New York City was incredibly fruitful for Edwards. While here, he developed an interest in international news and a desire to track what God was doing around the globe. He started his miscellaneous journal, his resolutions, and a diary. This time in New York was so enjoyable and fruitful, Edwards even considered a call back to this church in 1754. While here, Edwards connected a love for the sovereignty of God with his desire for holiness. Edwards wrote in his diary, that he felt the doctrines of election, free grace, and of our not being able to do anything without the grace of God, and that holiness is entirely throughout the work of God's Spirit more pleasantly than before. Thank you for joining us as we have explored Edwards, and I hope you'll join us for our next episode, Tracing Edwards' Transition from New York to Northampton.